All right, y'all, big topic, uh, not a lot of time. So we're gonna try to do a big review of these patients. So identifying adult congenital heart disease patients sounds pretty easy, right? You just ask and the patient comes into the office and says, I have congenital heart disease, should be pretty straightforward. Um, it's not always that simple. Sometimes you ask, have to ask moms, sometimes you ask, have to ask spouses, do a little bit of detective work on them. A scar is a good clue. So a, a young adult um, with a big median sternotomy scar or a thoracotomy scar, that's probably a pretty good sign that that patient um, had congenital heart disease and needs to be referred. Um, who needs to be seen the, in an, a, a specialized adult congenital heart disease center? Um, the basic answer is everybody. If you had congenital heart disease, you should be seen at least once. There are guidelines that, out that, that state pretty specifically that even if you have very simple congenital heart disease, you should be evaluated at least once by an adult congenital heart disease center. Um, if it's moderate to complex disease, you're gonna be seen on a regular basis in those centers. But even if it's a tiny VSD or a repaired ASD or something along those lines, it's a good idea to have those patients seen once in an adult congenital heart disease center to make sure that there's nothing else going on. And the bottom line is, this is my first girlfriend when I was 11, um, <laughs> Debbie Harry. Um, I'm still kind of infatuated with her to some degree, don't tell my wife. but. Um, you know, we're very passionate about this. So when you're taking care of adult congenital heart disease patients, identify, you know, the adult congenital heart disease expert you want to talk to, get their cell number, put it in your cell phone and call. Uh, because we all love to take these calls. We lo all love to kind of look smart and answer your questions. So if there are any questions, give us a call. Um, so this was a recent paper out of, I think, Royal Brompton um, in the UK trying to kind of summarize the common complications in adult congenital heart disease. And they use this acronym HEAP to help remember them, heart failure, endocarditis, arrhythmia, pulmonary hypertension. There are a lot of other things that we're worried about with these patients. Um, and so um, certainly heart failure and endocarditis and pulmonary hypertension, arrhythmia, but, but clot, thromboembolic events, um, infection, psychiatric disease we'll talk a little bit about, liver disease as well. And I tried to come up with some sort of acronym for this and I failed miserably, although when I look at this now, this just came, this could be like, you could do something with hate people or something. <laughs> um, but, but I actually had thrown this into a website um, that, that gives you acronyms here and, and none of them really worked out. This adentutinase was the only one that incorporated everything and I, I don't think it's gonna catch on. Um, but I like the hate people one. Um, so we're going to do a case real quick that will summarize a lot of the issues we see in adult congenital heart disease patients. Um, this is a complex patient, a 35-year-old patient of mine um, with tricuspid valve atresia, no blood getting into this tiny little RV, who through a series of operations over the course of his childhood ended up with this kind of old-timey, a uh, Fontan operation where the right atrium is hooked directly up to the pulmonary arteries. So all the blue blood from the SVC and the IVC comes directly into the right atrium. The ASD is closed, the tricuspid valve isn't there, and so all that blood ends up going out to the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. All the blood comes back from the lungs into the ventricle and get, gets ejected out to the body. Um, he's had a lot of problems. He's had sinus node dysfunction, has had transvenous pacemakers and epicardial pacemakers and infected pacemakers that had to be removed. He's had recurrent intraatrial reentrant tachycardia, so kind of an atypical atrial flutter that we see commonly in these patients. Um, he's had a lot of depression, um, and that depression has contributed to a lot of medical noncompliance. And, um, and he's hypertensive, and interestingly enough, through various procedures and surgeries, both of his subclavian arteries have been sacrificed. And so he's not hypertensive in his arms because his subclavian arteries are, are messed up. So, but if you get blood pressures in his legs, he's quite hypertensive. Um, but he's really, ref he's not taking his medicines. He's refusing any more aggressive therapy and he's depressed. And um, this is an old picture of his heart back when he had this transvenous pacemaker. Um, and we don't like these because it's a good, good place for clot to form in these patients. But you see this 
hugely dilated right atrium, blood just kind of sluggishly going through there out into the pulmonary arteries um, here. This is his uh, EKG. He's in this intraatrial reentrant tachycardia. Um, it's fairly obvious up here. You see these kind of sawtooth P waves marching on through. Can be a little harder over here. You look at this lead where he's kind of two to one conducting, and this looks a whole lot like sinus tachycardia. And, and I caution that when these patients show up to an emergency room with a heart rate of 110, um, think this, because often they're bradycardic at baseline, so that 110 may just be a, a two to one atrial arrhythmia um, that looks a whole lot like sinus, but every other P wave's kind of buried in the preceding uh, QRS. This is his echo. Um, pretty horrible looking. This is his right atrium that's hooked up to the pulmonary arteries. He's got this huge clot, lots of clot, very sluggish blow blood flow within that atrium. Um, you can imagine little bits of this clot breaking off and going out to his lungs over time and cause, causing recurrent little pulmonary emboli, bad form. And, and this is his ventricular function, um, which is not very good. Uh, so he's doing pretty poorly and he doesn't want to even talk heart transplant. He's not taking his meds, you know, and I give the kind of doom and gloom talk to this guy um, and his, his mother who came with him. Um, and then six months later, he comes back to see me again. And I've done nothing, although I'd like to take credit for this, but his function is better. This is that atrium. The clot is, is mostly gone, and, and most importantly, he's in sinus rhythm now. Um, and so the question is what happened, and the answer is he met a woman. Um, and he, he fell in love and got married very quickly, and said woman said, why don't you take that medicine? Might be a good idea. Um, and so he started taking his Coumadin and his amiodarone and his blood pressure medicine, and, um, and, and really looked great. Um, and you know, for whatever that, a cure for depression that is, it was working for him, um, and we were all quite thrilled, and for a couple of years he did quite well. And then um, he came into the hospital with an incarcerated abdominal hernia, and we could talk all day about anesthetic management of, of these complex patients. We're not going to. He actually does very well. We have a good cardiac, congenital cardiac anesthesiologist who does his anesthesia. Um, he gets operated on, he gets extubated almost immediately after surgery and does great, but then about a day later, it all starts to go bad on us again, and he's in complete heart block at this point. Um, we intubate him, we start to transcutaneously pace him. Remember, we can't put a transvenous pacemaker in him, right? Because his SVC and his IVC go into the right atrium, which goes right out to the pulmonary arteries, so there's no way to get to his ventricle from his veins. Um, he's sick. Um, about the same time, the, the docs who did his hernia repair bring us this picture and said, you know, he looks like the before picture in the liver transplants that we do. That's his liver. It's very fibrotic, very cirrhotic, uh, you know, and, and we kind of figured this because this happens to these patients over time. Um, and he goes to the operating room, gets a pacemaker. He gets extubated a few days later, and his creatinine bumps, but then it starts to fall, and we think, you know, maybe we're actually out of the woods with this guy. Um, but then over the next several weeks, his bilirubin starts to, starts to rise, and as his liver disease, as his liver failure worsens, his kidney disease starts to take over, and, and he ultimately becomes severely hypotensive and, and passes away. And so I think this guy really illustrates a lot of these issues. Um, heart failure, arrhythmia, clot, um, depression associated with non-compliance issues, um, liver disease as well. So he, he's a good illustrative example. Um, you're going to hear more about heart failure later, but basically heart failure is just the heart's not able to keep up with the metabolic demands of the body. Um, we see all of those symptoms that you think about for heart failure, exercise intolerance and orthopnea and edema and all those things in these adults. But I caution you, when we talk about exercise intolerance, it can be tricky with our adult congenital heart disease patients. So this is a study where they measured peak oxygen uptake. So basically, um, the most objective measurement we have for how well you do, in, you do with exercise. Um, and here are our normals. And here's a huge population, you know, lots of different types of adult congenital heart disease. And yeah, our, our single ventricle Fontans and our Eisenmenger chronically cyanotic patients and our Epsteins do very poorly um, in general. But even, you know, our well-repaired tetralogies and our arterial switches for, for transposition, some of those patients you think are going to do, you know, pretty normally, 
also on average don't do well. So these patients start with decreased exercise tolerance. And this is interesting. So if you plot peak oxygen uptake, so basically the higher up here you go, the better the exercise tolerance. And the farther out here you go, this is a, a survey saying how well are you doing? How do you think you do physically? So the further out here you are, the, the better you think you're doing. In general, the worse your exercise tolerance, the worse you think you're doing. But the reality is that patient-wise, there are a whole lot of patients out here with peak oxygen uptakes in the transplantable range. I mean, these people have horrible exercise tolerance. And if you ask them how they're doing, they say, I'm doing great. I'm completely normal. I have no problems at all. And the conclusion of this study was never trust the patient when they tell you your exercise tolerance is normal, which is why we get these cardiopulmonary stress tests on a regular basis, because we can track that and have some objective data to look at with these patients. So heart failure is exceptionally common in these patients, especially if you have systemic right ventricles, especially if you have single ventricles. Etiology is multifactorial. Um, chronic volume and pressure overload, big VSDs that caused a lot of volume overload, aortic stenosis that caused a lot of pressure overload. Um, damage may have been done when they were kids, or they may, there may be residual lesions causing problems. Poor myocardial preservation during surgery, arrhythmias, pacemakers potentially can lead to decreased heart function, chronic cyanosis, pulmonary vascular disease, and we don't want to forget acquired heart disease, so coronary artery disease and systemic hypertension and different things that could lead to worsening heart failure. So this is a, a patient of mine who's had an atrial switch operation for... Um, for transposition of the great arteries. So they've had a mustard operation. And basically, the pulmonary veins have been baffled across to the right atrium, and blood's going across the tricuspid valve into this RV. And the patient has transposition, so the RV is squeezing blood out to the aorta. Um, you look at the LV, the LV's happy as can be. It's pumping blood to the lungs. That's easy. LV function's fantastic. This RV is dilated, the function is somewhat decreased. These patients with systemic RVs are prone to heart failure over time. Our systemic, um, I mean, our single ventricle patients are very prone to heart failure as well. This is a patient with uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, tiny little left uh, ventricle over here, big systemic right ventricle, um, and they're in bad shape. That function is horrible. This is a patient who ultimately passed away on the transplant list. But sometimes it's not this obvious. This is another one of my single ventricle patients who has a double inlet left ventricle. These two AV valves and enter into this big LV with a little VSD here and a small RV over here. Um, but she has really significant heart failure symptoms and actually has cirrhosis. And this patient has developed hepatocellular carcinoma as well, which we see. Um, but her systolic function is great, so it's not always as simple as a decreased ejection fraction. Um, it is very important in these heart failure patients to rule out potentially reversible contributors to their heart failure. So arrhythmia, elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, sleep apnea and obesity, um, but most importantly, anatomic abnormalities. So is there residual stenosis, residual insufficiency of some of the AV valves? And coarctation is a big one. Is there any residual coarctation that's increasing afterload on the ventricle and contributing to heart failure? Medical therapy, we do. We don't have great data saying that it works, but we do it. All the typical things you do for heart failure in adults. Um, we use beta blockers, although some of our patients are prone to sinus node dysfunction, and you have to be careful with the beta blockers. Um, cardiac resynchronization therapy can, can help, and finally, transplant. And transplant certainly is a last option, but for some of these patients, it's, it's a very good last option. And they can be tricky to transplant. Um, sometimes they, their uh, pre-existing antibodies to other people's HLA types are high, which can make it harder to find a heart for them. Um, the surgical connections can sometimes be a little on the tricky side, and the, the early mortality may be higher after transplant. But if they get through the first six to 12 months, they tend to do very well. Um, and this is a population that can be extremely satisfying to transplant because some of them have never had two ventricles or have never had well-functioning ventricles and, and feel the best that they've ever felt with their transplanted heart. So it's something that we, we use when we need to. Um, now into arrhythmias. 
Arrhythmias are really common. It's kind of like prostate problems in men. If you live long enough, it's going to happen, right? And so if you have significant congenital heart disease and you live long enough, you're going to have it. Arrhythmias, complex disease, significant ventricular dysfunction, significant residual lesions, you know, recurrent stenoses, recurrent insufficiency of valves are going to increase that risk. We see a lot of bradyarrhythmias, um, sinus node dysfunction, real common in our patients who have had surgery close to the sinus node, like the atrial switch transposition patients, Fontan patients. Complete heart block, we typically see surgical complete heart block. So the kid had a big VSD, it got closed, the conduction system got nicked, they ended up with a pacemaker during that hospitalization. But there is a subset of our adult congenital patients who are at increased risk of developing congenital heart block as they get older. Specifically, our congenitally corrected transpositions or L transposition of the great artery patients where we have to pay attention to that. Tachyarrhythmia is very common, especially uh, supraventricular arrhythmias, um, atrial fib, atrial flutter, this kind of atypical atrial flutter, which we call intraatrial reentrant tachycardia or incisional atrial reentrant tachycardia. Um, we also see standard reentrant uh, SVT, often in our Epstein's patients who, who frequently have Wolf Parkinson White. Um, and then ventricular arrhythmias as well. Ventricular arrhythmias are, are quite common. Um, the supraventricular arrhythmias, they may be, need to be anticoagulated. And, and having them evaluated by a good congenital EP doctor is important because ablation may be a really good option for these patients. And, and the results from ablations have improved dramatically over time. Ventricular arrhythmias are a common cause of death in adult congenital heart disease. Um, defibrillators may be necessary. Defibrillators may be tricky. Um, if you remember, if some of these patients, you can't get to the ventricle from the veins, so they're not going to be able to get a transvenous defibrillator. Ablation may be an option, and you want to make sure you rule out any significant hemodynamic lesions. So the classic one were our tetralogy patients with lots of pulmonary valve insufficiency leading to progressive dilation of the right ventricle, leading to an increased risk of ventricular arrhythmias. Um, in some of those patients, you put a new valve in, the, the ventricle shrinks down, the function may get better, and we hope that the risk of arrhythmias is going to drop in that situation. And I think very importantly for this talk, in our adult congenital heart disease patients, syncope is an emergency. So if the patients had syncope, even if it, you know, I didn't eat breakfast and I was at church and it was hot and I stood up and I got the weakened dizzies, um, the typical vasovagal syncope that we see all the time, if, if they've got a scar on their chest, if they've got significant congenital heart disease, even though it very well may be innocent vasovagal syncope, we're going to want to prove it's not something worse than that. So they need to see the doctor. Um, clot, a lot of our patients are at increased risk for thromboembolic episodes. Our Fontan patients in particular may be hypercoagulable. Um, recurrent pulmonary emboli going out to the lungs may increase their pulmonary vascular resistance and decrease their cardiac output. Eisenmenger's patients, um, those cyanotic patients with unrepaired big shunts, um, may also be hypercoagulable. And if they form clot and that clot goes right to left across whatever shunt they have in their heart, then they can have a stroke or some other systemic embolic event. Um, at the same time, their bleeding risk is high. And pulmonary hemorrhage is fairly common in this population as well. So um, we take a very individualized approach to who needs to be on anticoagulation, who shouldn't be on anticoagulation in that group. Um, and finally, estrogen-containing birth control can increase the clot risk in some of these patients. So we want to be careful about that. Um, to summarize this in a nutshell, this was a, a study looking at long-term survival in Fontan patients. Um, and the most common causes of death were sudden death, presumed um, ventricular arrhythmias, heart failure, and thromboembolic events. And yes, this is for Fontan patients, but these are pretty common causes of, of, of morbidity and mortality in a lot of our adult congenital heart disease patients. So pulmonary hypertension. Um, we see this in a minority, but a significant minority of our patients with adult congenital heart disease. Um, you can have pulmonary hypertension for a bunch of different reasons. So classically, you have a big left to right shunt, an increased volume and pressure load on the lungs, which leads to progressive uh, vascular disease within the lungs and pulmonary hypertension. But there are other reasons. So you may have high pulmonary venous pressures. And, and 
Typically in the adult world, that's from left heart failure with increased end diastolic pressure on the left side. Everything going back, increased atrial pressures, increased ven pulmonary venous pressures causing pulmonary hypertension. In our congenital patients, we have to at least think, could there actually be anatomic pulmonary vein obstruction? Do they have pulmonary vein stenosis? Um, we might see that in some of our repaired anomalous pulmonary venous return patients. Do they have obstruction to the pulmonary venous baffle for their atrial switch procedure for their transposition of the great arteries? And some of these patients still have high pulmonary blood flow. They may have residual VSDs or ASDs that are increasing blood flow to the lungs and causing some pulmonary hypertension. So the causes are diverse. Some patients will have pulmonary hypertension for multiple different causes, so you have to work them up very carefully. Um, and not surprisingly, if you have pulmonary hypertension, you don't do as well. Two times the mortality, three times the associated costs. So this can be a big deal. Um, pulmonary hypertension gets divided up into four main groups in our congenital heart disease patients. These Eisenmengers, which you know, used to be a lot of what adult congenital heart disease was, was taking care of unrepaired VSDs or unrepaired AV canal defects who had developed Eisenmenger syndrome and a, a big right to left shunt. Um, we're seeing fewer and fewer of these because these patients now are getting repaired when they're kids. So this is, this is not as common. Um, you've got your patients that still have significant left to right shunts leading to pulmonary hypertension. And the big question with those, those patients are, are they fixable or not? They may have high pulmonary artery pressures, but if their pulmonary vascular resistance is low, or if their pulmonary vascular resistance responds favorably in the cath lab to, to vasodilators, you may be able to fix them. But there are other patients that, that if their PVR is high and you fix them, they're going to get in a lot of trouble. Um, then you've got this group where, yeah, they've got some congenital heart disease, but is it related to their significant pulmonary hypertension? Who knows? Um, little tiny ASD or a little VSD in a patient with significant pulmonary hypertension, that may just be idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Um, and finally, this, this group of patients who've had their hearts repaired but still have significant pulmonary hypertension. And that may be a, apparent immediately after surgery or it may show up years after surgery. And that's a patient population that doesn't do as well. Um, pulmonary hypertension, so the vast majority of patients with post-tricuspid valve shunts so VSDs, PDAs, things where the pulmonary arteries are not only going to see increased flow, they're going to see increased pressure. They're going to develop significant pulmonary hypertension over the first couple of years of life. Um, Pre-tricuspid shunts like ASDs and partial anomalous pulmonary venous return, most of them don't. So less than 2% of them will go on to develop Eisenmengers. So the question always with those patients is, why did they develop pulmonary hypertension? Did they have a genetic predisposition? predisposition already? Um, is it completely unrelated to their heart disease? What does this mean? But we do see this every once in a while. We're going to skip through that. Briefly on our Eisenmenger syndrome patients, um, we, we, you know, I still have several of these patients in my clinic, although certainly not as many as I had 10 or 20 years ago. Um, Eisenmenger's is cyanosis due to a large shunt that causes progressive pulmonary vascular disease, ultimately resulting in a um, shift from a left to right shunt to a right to left shunt and cyanosis. And people often use this term irreversible pulmonary hypertension. And I think that's somewhat of a misnomer because it implies that things that we do to lower the pulmonary vascular resistance won't help them. And we have very, very good data that you can improve quality of life and exercise tolerance in these Eisenmenger patients with pulmonary hypertension drugs. Um, so that's another reason these patients should be followed in an adult congenital heart disease program because this data comes out that kind of surprises us. We didn't think it would make people feel better. In fact, we thought it might make people a whole lot worse to use these drugs, and in fact, it helps them. We used to routinely phlebotomize these patients, bring them in every month, take some blood off of them to try to cut down on the viscosity of, of their blood. Um, what we've learned over time is that iron deficiency and dehydration is much worse for these patients. And bringing someone in once a month and taking a bunch of blood off of them certainly can lead to de iron deficiency, certainly can lead to dehydration. Um, so we watch out for that. And when these patients show up in an emergency room um, and the ER doc calls and says they're here for a headache, but their labs are fine, I always say, well, what's fine? What's their hemoglobin? And if the hemoglobin's 13, that's not fine. Um, it may be fine for me, but it's not fine for someone who's got baseline SATs of 
their hemoglobin ought to be 16 or 17 or 18. That's a patient you're going to want to work up for iron deficiency because you can make them feel a lot better if you treat their iron deficiency. So now kind of from pulmonary hypertension over to, to mental disorders in adults with congenital heart disease. This was a recent study out of Germany where they compared their adult congenital population with the general population in Germany. Um, if you look at AXIS-1 psychiatric diagnoses, 48% of their adult congenital heart disease sample, which was 150 patients. Interestingly, 36% of the general German population had an AXIS-1 diagnosis. I have no clue what the US numbers would be there. I, I wonder what adult congenital heart disease doctors, what our numbers would be there. But, um, <laughs> you know, depression, mood disorders, including depression, very, very common, about a, th a quarter to a third of the patients. And anxiety disorder also seen in about a quarter of the patients. And, and these psychiatric issues can play a huge role in quality of life, a huge role in patient compliance. Um, and if you're fortunate enough, and this is a big if, but if you can get these patients in to see a good mental health provider, it can make a world of difference, improve quality of life, improve their compliance, and drastically improve how easy it is to take care of them. Instead of spending your entire clinic visit trying to deal with anxiety, you can spend it trying to deal with their heart problems. Um, so this is something to think about. Um, I refer a lot when I can, but often um, I can't because there aren't good options for some of these patients. Um, Infection, so uh, hepatitis C in particular, um, is pretty common in the older adult congenital population. And, and to kind of save some time, um, this study out of Emory, basically adults who had heart surgery before 1992, when we started routinely screening for hepatitis C, had about a five-fold increase in the risk of active hep C infection compared to normal population. Um, and importantly, the vast majority of those patients had normal AST, normal ALT. So just because baseline labs are normal doesn't mean you don't have hepatitis C and you need to screen these patients um, for a lot of different reasons. One of which is because our congenital patients are prone to liver disease. And classically, that's our Fontan patients. Um, this study looking at symptomatic adult Fontans but also looking at pediatric Fontans, the majority of them have fibrosis in their heart. Um, lots of them have nodularity. Lots of them have varices. And I've had um, a few of my Fontan patients with bleeding varices. Um, and, and we need to worry about liver disease and worry about cirrhosis in this population. Um, but it's not just our Fontan patients. It's our patients that have low cardiac output and high central venous pressures. Why do they get liver disease? And this is for our single ventricles, but it applies to a lot of our patients. Um, they're born and they're often quite sick. The patients are acidotic and hypoxic and their livers can take a hit with that. And then they go through a bunch of heart surgeries when they're kids and they're on bypass and their liver can take a hit with that. And then they have traditional risk factors, alcohol and hepatitis C we talked about and medications like amiodarone and other drugs that potentially can hurt your liver. Um, and then there's that high central venous pressure that can stretch the liver and cause damage over time. Um, so more and more we have to think about this liver, um, liver disease. And, and we all as adult congenital heart disease doctors have had this moment where our patient needs a heart transplant. It's a good time for a heart transplant. And then lo and behold, you look and you find really significant liver disease. And maybe a heart transplant's not enough. Maybe they need a heart liver transplant, which is a much bigger deal for these patients. Um, and importantly, once again, routine lab testing is frequently normal. Um, so you really have to investigate the liver to figure out if there's problem there. Um, endocarditis, real quick, it's more common in our adult congenital heart disease patients. You need a high index of suspicion. So it's easy when they've got fever, night sweats, and weight loss. Um, it, it's a little harder when, yeah, I'm having some fevers, I just don't feel right, but otherwise the patient looks, looks okay. So if, you know, the patient's having fevers and you're thinking, maybe it's just a sinus infection, maybe I should put them on some antibiotics, get cultures before that. Um, because it's a, hard, a whole lot harder to diagnose their endocarditis um, if they've already been on antibiotics. Um, but we have a very low index of suspicion for endocarditis in these patients. Um, 
you know, I may get in trouble for saying this. There, you know, some people I'm told now that maybe there isn't an increased risk of endocarditis with melody valves. Um, but it's certainly with any sort of artificial valve in the heart, um, be it mechanical or be it bioprosthetic, we need to worry about endocarditis in those patients. Um, and finally, it's very important to encourage good dental and skin hygiene. And, and I stress that because our patients who are taught you can get endocarditis, you have to take antibiotics for dental work. Sometimes what they hear is, well, then I'm just not going to go to the dentist. Um, and that's not what we want. We want dentists. So my review, um, first of all, uh, beware of syncope, beware of palpitations, beware of signs of endocarditis, beware of new onset heart failure symptoms. Who to refer? Refer everybody. So even if it's just once, if they've got congenital heart disease, get them evaluated. Um, don't forget regular preventative care. So, you know, the good news is these patients are living. They're living long enough to get coronary artery disease and diabetes. Um, and finally, call us with any questions that you have.